in the desert of North Africa in the summer of 1942. A small band of soldiers were selected by the British for a unique mission. They all had the same special skill. They spoke fluent German. These men were the children of German Jews, victims of the Holocaust. And now they would have their revenge. They called themselves the Lions of Judah. They were hurt by the Nazis and they wanted to take revenge in fighting the Nazis. They had a motive to fight the Nazis. The Lions of Judah were the Special Interrogation Group, or SIG. They consisted of less than 40 men and were operational for just six months in 1942. Nothing could be closer than men who are all in it together, saving each other's lives, have all been through it. Operating exclusively behind enemy lines, their mission was simple. Elimination, sabotage and demolition. Anything that would disrupt and demoralize the German army. They did the job to cross the line and lay ambushes or patrol uh, terrain behind enemy line. In all of their operations, they would face overwhelming odds. During their short quest to disrupt the Nazi war effort in North Africa, almost all were killed. My father uh, was a brave man. He gave his life for his country. This is the extraordinary story of the Special Interrogation Group and how they became part of British military folklore. In March 1942, a man staggered out of the desert in North Africa. He wore an Africa Corps uniform of the German army. Bloodied and dying of thirst, he had to make it back to base. Finally, after many days, he glimpsed civilization. Before him, the outskirts of the city of Tobruk, the base for the British forces. He was quickly spotted, picked up, and taken to the British HQ, where he was treated for his wounds, given clean clothes and a stiff drink, then driven to British High Command in Cairo. Only then did he meet with his commanding officers. For the man was not a German, but Captain Herbert Buck of the Scots Guards, and he had an extraordinary tale to tell. Buck had been out fighting with the British Eighth Army west of Tobruk in January 1942, when he was wounded and captured. He was shackled and taken away in a truck, but the Germans had no idea just how dangerous this soldier was. Captain Beck succeeded to evade German captivity by killing the driver who took him into captivity and wearing his uh, uniform and taking his arms, throwing out his body from the cabin, and he crossed the Western Desert as a German. Buck easily passed himself off as a German soldier. Wearing an Africa Corps uniform, he simply marched back to British territory, passing through Axis lines without difficulty. That was why, two weeks after escaping, Buck was back in British hands. As he related his experience to his superiors, an idea began to formulate in their minds. 
Buck seemed the ideal man to put in charge of a new unit called the Special Interrogation Group, or SIG. The job of the SIG was to go behind the enemy lines to create chaos. For that, they needed men fluent in German and willing to operate in hostile territory. Buck's own experience made him the perfect leader. The SIG were needed urgently because the German army were on the march in North Africa. General Erwin Rommel and his Africa Corps had landed at Tripoli in Libya in February 1941. Despite being outnumbered, Rommel surprised the British by attacking, driving them out of Libya in just weeks. As the British were forced to retreat to the Egyptian border, they realized it would take more than just conventional forces to beat this foe. That was why the SIG was formed. the SIG would be predominantly drawn from one particular body of men. The 51st Middle East Commando were a 600-strong unit made up mostly of German-speaking Jews who'd fled the Nazis. Most of them had some previous account to settle with the Germans. They experienced the regime of persecution German Jewry underwent since uh, 1933. So this was a special motivation. In October 1941, the 51st were part of a commando force whose mission was to attack Rommel's headquarters and kill him. They failed, but most of the 51st got away unscathed. Among its ranks was a 26-year-old German Jew, Maurice Tiefenbrunner. In 1938, Maurice and his family were deported to Poland, but he escaped. Leaving his family, he eventually found his way to Antwerp in Belgium. I said goodbye to my parents. I didn't know that I will not come back. Nobody dreamt of a, a war yet. And, uh, and all the difficulties came on later. But if I would have known that, I probably would have, wouldn't have left, wouldn't have left my parents. With help from the Jewish underground movement in Europe, Tiefenbrunner and 950 other Jewish refugees boarded a ship in Marseille, bound for Palestine, in June 1939. Even in those early days, his strength of character was apparent. The SS Perita reached Palestine, but the British refused permission for it to dock. Tiefenbrunner seized control of the ship and ran it aground on Tel Aviv Beach. He was interned by the British, but two weeks later war broke out and he was released and granted Palestinian citizenship. Enlisted in the British Army and fought with the 51st Commando, where he witnessed the horrors of desert warfare. We were in a state of shock, many of us, because we lost personal friends. I lost my second gunner, Joseph, was really, we were so close friends, and he was killed to bits uh, next to me, and I was the lucky one. On the 17th of March, 1942, Tiefenbrunner and the other men of the 51st were resting at a camp near the Suez Canal when a stranger appeared. It was Captain Herbert Buck. A cryptic entry by the commanding officer in the 51st diary for that day reads, Captain Buck selects Germans. Captain Buck was 
a person to be trusted, a person you could talk to, a person, also he was uh, from a very aristocratic family who would speak like men to men, right, and highly intelligent. Buck said he was looking for men for a different kind of challenge. He addressed us with that idea, what we could do if we would uh, volunteer for this kind of work. He said we um, would be trained by uh, experienced people to behave like German soldiers, put on German uniforms and go into enemy territory and do intelligence as well as sabotage work there. In the days that followed, Buck recruited almost 30 men to his new SIG, including Tiefenbrunner. Volunteering for the commando was one step nearer to my aim to hurt the Nazis as much as possible and perhaps being in a position to help my parents who were, didn't know what, in what condition they are. So um, I and 27 others, we volunteered and said we are willing to take the risk and uh, go. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything, from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. While most of the SIG were Jews from the 51st, some were recruited from free Czech forces and the French Foreign Legion. The only criterion for selection was that they would be able to impersonate German soldiers impeccably. With the team assembled, the training began. Training went very well. We learned how to march in good step. We learned how to uh, curse each other in, in German. We learned how to snore in, in, uh, in German. And all these things to look as normal as possible, to act like German soldiers. The SIG had to master all aspects of German military machinery, weaponry, and conduct because their disguise had to be flawless. This note was sent to headquarters in Cairo requesting equipment in the shape of one German staff car and two one and a half ton trucks. Any other captured German equipment was highly valued and put to immediate use. They used German light weapons like Schmeisser field rifle, other uh, German machine guns, MG-34, whatever. Uh, they wore German uniform. They had German helmets. They used German notebooks. The smallest details were German. Then Buck took a gamble and recruited two German prisoners of war to help in the training. This was his idea. And the role of the German prisoners of war was to teach the current military German language, the current orders, habits, customs in the German army. Walter Essner and Herbert Bruckner had been captured in November 1941, serving in the 361st Regiment of the Africa Corps. They claimed to be anti-Nazis and were recruited by Buck to teach the SIG everything they knew about the Africa Corps. But first Buck had to ask permission to hire them. In his plans for the SIG, he described the decision as a necessary risk for training purposes to have 
men who had recently been in the German army. But Tiefenbrunner had his suspicions and went to Buck to tell him. Captain Buck said to me, uh, Morris, everything is all right. They, uh, they have been uh, tried and they have been uh, interviewed and they have been interrogated uh, and uh, uh, they have been observed. They are 100% all right. They are really idealists fighting the Nazis, like you. Buck's instinct was that the Germans could be trusted and the training continued. The SIG were based on their own site, but within earshot of the main British camp. Every morning, the British would hear the SIG being woken with the alarming words, Company Ampfsteier, or Company, get up. The men would be questioned suddenly on their German identities and march to the mess room for interrogation. The tough regime knitted them into a team that became experts in handling explosives, desert navigation, and unarmed combat. They also became skilled mechanics and drivers of German vehicles. But no one in the camp had any idea what mission these men were training for. Initially, the SIG mingled in prisoner of war camps with German soldiers to gather intelligence and learn how they behaved. This was the interrogation part of their job. Only then could they be deployed on exploratory sorties behind enemy lines. But the Nazis soon got wind that there were German spies in their camps. In fact, in June 1942, British intelligence translated a secret message from Hitler to Rommel regarding the existence of numerous German political refugees fighting in Africa, and that should they not be mercilessly wiped out in battle, should have a military sentence pronounced immediately. The Nazis would show no mercy to the men of the SIG. Capture would mean certain death. But by now, the SIG were needed more than ever because the war in North Africa had taken a turn for the worse. In June 1942, Rommel began a massive new assault on British forces. His Africa Corps crossed the Egyptian border and drove the British Eighth Army deep into Egypt. Rommel was less than 100 miles from the Suez Canal. If that fell, then the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean would be under threat. Now was the time for the SIG. And their first mission was about as deadly as it could be. The British were particularly troubled by enemy aircraft based on the North African coast. They were bombing Royal Navy ships, resupplying the 8th Army. The SIG's task was to assist a new Special Forces unit, the Special Air Service, or SAS, and destroy as many aircraft as possible at two airfields a hundred miles west of Tobruk. The SAS was founded by Colonel David Sterling of the Scots Guards. Sterling had a lot to prove. 
a third of the SAS had been killed or captured on their very first operation in Libya. It was Sterling who requested that the SIG assist with his new mission. But were they ready for action? Though he was keen to fight the Nazis, Maurice Tiefenbrunner still had real concerns about the two Germans training the SIG. Esner and Bruckner uh, were very good instructors. But uh, when we were told that very soon we go in action and uh, Bruckner and uh, the two German soldiers will go with us, I uh, protested. I said, it's too dangerous. Tiefenbrunner's concerns were ignored and he and the SIG were transported to the vast Siwa oasis in Egypt. Esner and Bruckner accompanied them. From there, 12 SIG men, including Tiefenbrunner, boarded a captured Africa Corps truck and a British three-ton lorry. Fourteen men from a free French squadron also climbed in the back of the lorries. They were to act as captured prisoners of war. The SIG would be their German guards. We as the guards have taken prisoner these soldiers. So whenever they are on any checkpost, so we are, to, we are taking the soldiers uh, back to uh, some camp, right? Where we, that's our order, right? On the 8th of June, 1942, the SIG set out from Siwa, escorted by the SAS. After four days, their escort left, and Tiefenbrunner and the SIG changed into their German uniforms. Now, they were on their own. One lorry was driven by the German prisoner of war, Bruckner, and had nine French soldiers in the back. On the other lorry, there is some more free French, and uh, the rest of the group, and with uh, Captain Buck uh, being the driver, and um, uh, Esner going with. Atop each truck was an SIG guard, posted German style as a lookout. Each man carried a German issue Luger pistol, machine gun, bayonet, and grenades. The French were dressed in khaki with blue caps and carried a pistol each. And each lorry also concealed two ready mounted machine guns. The convoy soon came across several roadblocks manned by Germans and Italians but their disguise was convincing, and they were waved through, even being warned about the presence of British commandos. They spent the night a few miles from the two airfields, their intended targets. The next day, they carried out their first reconnaissance, the Germans Esner and Bruckner were sent to a German outpost and came back with the password for entry to the airfields. The raid could now begin. At 9pm on the 13th of June, Buck and the German prisoner Esner took three SIG and five French to the Martuba airfield. The French commanding officer and the other German prisoner, Bruckner, took nine French and the remaining SIG to the airfield at Derna. Tiefenbrunner stayed behind at the rendezvous point. I was detailed to be the liaison officer between the two camps and being in touch on the walkie-talkie right, at that time right, to the progress which they are making on the way. Right. 
So I used my, they went out on this side, and the others went on this side, and I was in charge of the in-between. Later that night, Buck's group returned to Tiefenbrunner with no casualties and revealed that their mission had been a total success. Twenty-seven German aircraft had been destroyed at the Martuba airfield. But what of the other party? Somewhere in the darkness, Tiefenbrunner heard a commotion. I heard the noise and the things with shouting and thing, and uh, the free French officer who was with the uh, lieutenant who was in charge of the group came back with one other uh, free French uh, soldier who said, what's, what's going on? What, what happened? I asked him. And he was completely out of breath and he had to give him some time until he could speak to me. The French officer told him that en route to the airfield at Derna, German prisoner of war Bruckner had slammed his hand down on the dashboard. Bruckner said, there is something wrong with the motor. He, I will uh, try to fix the stop and said, wait here. And he opened up the hoop and uh, looked at the motor and fiddled some around and said, no, I can't fix it myself. I'm going to the garage nearby, I have just passed by. Uh, I will ask their help. Bruckner never returned. Minutes later, the truck was surrounded by Germans who ordered all French out. No one moved. Instead, the SIG's machine guns opened up. In the fierce firefight, many Germans died, but not before they'd killed the three SIG men and seven free French soldiers. Though shocked at their losses, Buck, Tiefenbrunner, and the remaining men gathered their equipment and headed back to base. It was clear that Bruckner had betrayed the SIG. Captain Buck was devastated and was now more concerned about the other German, Esner. Very ashamed of myself. I said, look here. I will take it up on myself. We're going now back. We try to get back to to our uh, uh, our camp, but I will sitting next to Esner. For me now, he was a German, an enemy, right? And uh, I said, nothing else uh, mattered. And I said, when you move, you are a dead man. Tiefenbrunner guarded Esner for the week-long journey back to base. When we came to our camp. I said, this man has to be taken to uh, uh, British headquarters, but he's very dangerous. If he moves, makes a wrong move, shoot him. Don't take any risk with him. He will try to shoot you or escape. So was Esner a double agent too? We will never know. But he did try to escape and was shot dead. In subsequent weeks, the full story behind the airfield raids became clear. Two Luftwaffe pilots captured in July 1942 revealed that the Germans knew the SIG were coming weeks before the raid. It was also rumored that Bruckner was flown to Berlin and awarded a Golden Iron Cross, and that this double agent's real name was in fact Brockman. And though the raid on the airfields was partly successful, it didn't slow Rommel's Africa Corps. Rommel, who by now had been promoted to field marshal, made an attempt to break through to the Egyptian capital, Cairo. If Cairo fell, it would only be a matter of time before the German army reached the Suez Canal, 
who controlled all shipping in and out of the Mediterranean. A British defeat looked beyond the cards. But Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery had other ideas. Montgomery had been tipped off by British intelligence and was ready for Rommel. In the Battle of Alam al Halfa, Monty deliberately left a gap in the front line, enticing Rommel to attack. He then ordered his tanks to remain in their positions instead of charging the enemy. The ground was now laid for the fiercest of battles, and Monty held the line. Meanwhile, British High Command in Cairo once again summoned Captain Herbert Buck of the SIG, where he was given orders for the SIG's next mission. It was even more dangerous than their first. In early September 1942, Tiefenbrunner and the other commandos were sent to a new base deep in the Sahara called Kufra. The Kufra base was home to another special force, the Long Range Desert Group, or LRDG. The LRDG was made up almost entirely of men from New Zealand and Rhodesia. Many of its members would go on to serve in the SAS. The LRDG were experts in desert navigation and specialized in reconnaissance and intelligence. During their stay at Kufra, the SIG rested or went swimming in either the salt lake or the fresh water pool constructed by the LRDG. But finding the SIG drilling in German uniforms and using German commands astonished even them. Then on the 5th of September, Lieutenant Colonel John Hazelden the man who would command the SIG on their next mission, and 83 men of the SAS drove into the Kufra base. My father was pretty athletic. He was a good shot. He rowed. He sailed. Uh, he had a thoroughly good time, if you ask me. Hazelden was born in Egypt and was fluent in both Arabic and Italian. His love for the land of his birth was his motivation for keeping the Nazis out. He arrived in Kufra to collect the men of the SIG for a perilous mission. It was called Operation Agreement, a raid on Tobruk. He was the man who had the idea first, but his original plan was only to go uh, on the raid with a handful of men, say 20, no more. But it wasn't to be. I think what happened was that uh, the planners got hold of the idea that what a super thing it would be to smash up to Brook totally. Uh, and it, it blossomed into some enormous raid. To Brook was the most important seaport in Libya. It was the chief supply route for Rommel's army. It had been captured by the Africa Corps on the 21st of June, 1942. By September, Tobruk and the surrounding coastline had become heavily fortified. Rommel had 50,000 men and over 400 tanks in and around the port. And there were anti-aircraft and shipping defenses spread along the shoreline. The British knew that if they could destroy Tobruk, they would strangle Rommel's army. Operation Agreement was to be a three-pronged attack. The 
Royal Air Force would begin the operation with a surprise bombing raid. The combined SAS and SIG team, codenamed Force B, were to destroy the coastal guns east of Tobruk. With the guns knocked out, 396 commandos waiting offshore on board HMS Zulu, HMS Seek, and HMS Coventry would attempt a landing west of the port. They were codenamed Force C. And then an amphibious assault by motor torpedo boat, codenamed Force A, would land and attempt an assault on the port itself. As in the raids on the Libyan airfields in June, the SIG would play the same trick they trained for. The SIG were to be disguised as Germans, but this time would be escorting British prisoners of war, the SAS. The SIG would be dressed in German uniforms, speaking German and carrying German weapons, paybooks, insignia, cigarettes, chocolates, and even love letters from fictitious wives in Germany. Joining Captain Buck and the SIG for this mission was a new officer from the SAS. Lieutenant David Russell had approached Buck and volunteered his services. Buck had spotted or been told about David Russell, who was fluent in six dialects, spoke German like a, a German, and um, ha would have contacted him. Russell had no illusions about what he was getting into. It is what you would say is high, very high risk. I think they all had the intention of coming out alive if they could, but they knew how dangerous it was. On the 5th of September, Force B, including Captain Buck, David Russell, and six men of the SIG, left Kufra for the 800-mile journey to Tobruk. They traveled in German trucks that had been painted with stolen Africa Corps stencils. After leaving their base, Force B were soon finding the going hard. In searing heat, they had to negotiate great seas of sand and almost sheer cliffs to reach their objective. Trucks had to be dug out of the sand on several occasions. But on the 10th of September, Force B reached Hatyat Etla, a depression in the desert where they could hide and rest without fear of discovery. They would stay here for three days, rehearsing their assault on Tobruk, even having time to pose for photographs. This is most of the group, with Lieutenant Colonel Hasselden in the center. Here are the sappers in the group. On the 13th, Hasselden read his men a morale-boosting telegram. It came from Churchill himself. With their spirits raised, Force B and the SIG, now just 90 miles from Tobruk, set off for their objective. At first, the convoy did not attract attention from the German and Italian patrols. Four miles from Tobruk, one of the trucks was deliberately disabled and parked for use as a getaway vehicle. The three remaining trucks each had 30 SAS acting as prisoners of war and were driven, of course, by the German-speaking SIG. But as day turned to night, they faced their first test. Out of the darkness, the lead truck was challenged loudly in German. It stopped, and a German guard began asking more questions than anyone was expecting. Fearing they'd been rumbled, David Russell did what he had to do. David jumps off, 
goes into the darkness, then comes back with a gun, chucks it back into the lorry and says he won't need this anymore. And he does write to his sister saying, um, when you feel as I do about family, it is very difficult to steal yourself and to have to go and kill people in cold blood. But in this game, it's kill or be killed. And uh, if you're on the run and you're being hunted, your blood's up and you just have to go and uh, try and save your life and anybody with you. It was now 10.30 p.m. Above the convoy, the RAF were about to signal the start of the mission. Cover of the bombing raid, Hazelden, Buck, Russell, and Force B reached a small house overlooking Tobruk. They burst in and drove out or killed the Italian platoon inside. From here, they and their fellow commandos could stage raids on their intended targets the coastal gun emplacements. The SIG and SAS teams worked separately through the night and knocked out as many of the guns as they could. At 2 a.m., they were satisfied that enough guns had been destroyed and signaled that landings could commence. So far, Operation Agreement was going to plan. But as the sun rose above the horizon on the 15th of September, the enemy, now fully alerted, regrouped and closed in on Force B. Realizing they were under attack, the Germans sent in masses of reinforcements. Cut off and outnumbered behind enemy lines, Force B, the SAS and the SIG were now sitting ducks. But they continued with their mission. They moved inland and took control of four anti-aircraft positions. But they were soon in deep trouble. They were beginning to be overrun by both Italians and Germans. And uh, you know, after all, they were a very small force, uh, split in two. And uh, my father's uh, headquarters were, were being besieged. Though they'd achieved their objective, Force B were now isolated and alone in hostile territory. They knew they were in trouble and managed to get a message to headquarters. They received a reply that shook them. It acknowledged that Force B had done its job, but HMS Seek had been disabled. HMS Zulu had retreated after being hit while towing HMS Seek. HMS Coventry had been hit and was on fire, and that Force A had failed to land and were withdrawing. Operation Agreement had failed. Commander of Force B, Lieutenant Colonel Hasselden, knew that time was running out. He now ordered everyone to destroy their belongings and then he gave the order to retreat. The SIG retrieved the getaway truck. David Russell brought the truck up to the headquarters that uh, Hazelden had taken on, and they put the wounded into that. But uh, by this time, some Germans had arrived and were shooting at them. So um, Hazelden, who was following in the wireless operator's truck, uh, then came rushing back, and David Russell and a whole lot of men were sort of covering fire, giving covering fire for the wounded truck, etc. And I think it was then every man for himself. Hazelden jumped into the truck with the remnants of Force B and drove off. 
but after just a few hundred yards, he braked hard and jumped out. He decided to stall the enemy by standing and fighting. My father decided that he needed to try and drive the enemy back, and he single-handedly charged uh, uh, the German positions, which, which, and apparently, so I read, they were forced back to, and the trucks managed to get through. Three men of the SIG joined Hasselden, and they fought a pitch battle with the advancing forces. But they were soon overwhelmed, and Hasselden was in trouble. Unfortunately, he was killed, and while he was on the ground, a hand grenade uh, uh, exploded on top of him. Uh, and one of the SIG men, uh, uh, Hillman, I think, uh, was bending over him when this bomb actually exploded. But it didn't kill him, but his face was totally blackened. But thanks to Hazelden, the SIG had enough time to escape. My father uh, was a brave man. He gave his life for his country. Um, I don't suppose for a minute he thought that uh, he was going to be killed. I, I don't think you go into battle thinking I'm going to be killed, because if you do, you can't really achieve anything. You have, it may be there, but you have to push it to the back of your mind and get on with what you're doing. Otherwise, you've defeated before you start. From the original Force B party of 90 men, six of the SIG survived. Together they marched across the desert in search of Allied forces. After many close calls with the enemy and suffering from malnutrition and dehydration, Captain Buck, David Russell, and the SIG reached Allied lines two months later, on the 18th of November, 1942. The assault on Tobruk had been an unmitigated disaster. From a fighting force of about a thousand, the Allies lost 746 men, along with HMS Coventry, HMS Sikh, HMS Zulu, and several other amphibious boats. German and Italian casualties amounted to just 16. I think there's agreement throughout uh, everything I've read that it, it was a disaster. It should never have, uh, it shouldn't have been allowed, quite honestly. The failure at Tobruk marked the end of the SIG and surviving members were transferred to other units. Many would distinguish themselves in battles to come. David Russell was asked to take over the guards patrol of the Long Range Desert Group. And I think everybody felt, you know, he'd really done quite a good job, having been a wild card to begin with. Lieutenant David Russell later joined British intelligence, but was murdered in Romania in 1943. In letters to his family, there was no doubt of his fondness for his comrades in the SIG. You admire the qualities in the people. You really get to know each other, and you, you act as one. And I'm sure that David and the SIG and the SAS men did that too. Captain Herbert Buck was killed in a plane crash while serving with the SAS in 1946. Morris Stephen Brunner also joined the SAS and became David Sterling's interpreter. He survived the war and is the only original member of the SIG living today. The SIG did um, the job they were asked to do, and a bit more than that. I think that uh, we fulfilled uh, a duty which uh, could not be done by, uh, by uh, a whole normal regular army, because we were spring the prize on uh, Onto, uh, and uh, carried out action which uh, was in complete surprise of our enemy. To 
Tobruk, whose name is written deep in our Middle East campaigns. Tobruk, which we held as a fortress behind the enemy lines for nine months and which had already changed hands twice, was ours once more. The date was November the 13th. The British forces in the Second World War spawned many daring, special or unconventional units. The SIG were the least known, but those that passed through its ranks were unique in their background, their training, but above all, their courage. <laughs> 